among fixing up a broken fence and other mundane physical tasks that would require me to work and break my back in intense physical heat. I sure remember that summer as the summer of sunburns, I'd like to call it, and almost getting killed by the same creature. So let me give you some quick backstory. This barn, I don't want to say it was far away from his house, but it was maybe a good two, three hundred yards away. Right by it were a thick patch of woods. I had already been working on this barn for at least a month now, as it was now later July, and it needed many things, among a new fresh coat of paint, more wood, all sorts of stuff. My list of job duties went on too long, to be honest with you. But the old man paid me really good, so I didn't mind. And one afternoon, I was in this barn, just tidying things up, when I heard movement outside the barn. I thought it was Glenn, the old man, so I called out. Glenn, is that you? Nothing. I thought that was strange, so I went back to raking some spare hay. Then... I heard movement again, but this time it was moving from the side of the barn by the back towards the front entrance. Even though there were holes in the wood, I could barely see movement. I really couldn't tell who or what it was, so I stuck my rake against the wall and walked out the barn door to see who it was, thinking it was maybe Glenn who needed my attention or needed help with something. I go through the door, go on to the side of the barn and immediately freeze. It's that thing again. And, like some sort of horrific memory, some traumatic reliving event, everything comes flying back all in one moment. The 12-year-old event, when I was 16, and now this. I nearly fell on my knees to this thing's mercy as it approached me slowly, looking more angrier and upset than ever. This thing, I'll never forget. The image burned in my mind. This thing had saliva coming down its mouth, teeth exposed, bared, reaching its right hand up for me, like it wanted to clasp it around my throat and tear my head off. I fell to my knees. I didn't know what to do. I was just so weakened and unable to bear the fear this thing continues its gait towards me, takes a step at a time, and is now maybe five feet away from me. My body will not move. I'm completely at the mercy of this demon. And then it raises its right arm up, clasps its hand, while looking down at me. Bam! Boom! A bullet goes right into this thing's throat. Blood shoots, and this thing screams, this terrible scream, and kind of staggers and backs away, opens its eyes, and looks up. Directly behind me was Glenn with a shotgun. I'm nearly deaf now, my ears ringing from the blast. This thing turns its attention to Glenn, looking more angrier and pissed off than ever, with blood running down its upper chest and throat. It begins to walk towards him. Bam! Bam! Fires two more shots. I was convinced I was going to be deaf. When you're only ten feet away from a shotgun blast. Multiple blasts. Somehow, my eardrums didn't burst. I couldn't hear much besides the blasts. I even barely heard this thing scream. It kind of dropped back, turned around, and jumped off into the tree line. There is a blood trail. Glenn ran after it. Didn't even say anything to me. Just runs right into the tree line. Disappears for maybe a moment. Bam! I hear him firing off again in the woods. Quiet. Bam! Bam! His gunshots are getting further and further away. And I'm stuck there. On my knees. Completely traumatized. Like a soldier at war who's just seen his friends massacred in front of him. Unable to fully function and process the reality 
that I was just dealt with. I couldn't even tell you how long I sat there on my knees before Glenn reappeared with the most stern and serious expression on his face. Get up, boy, he told me. He pulled me by the collar all the way back to his house, threw me down on the porch, looked me in the eye and said, From now on, you're not going over to that barn alone. I've been having problems around here for a while now. The things other people don't understand. You got that? I'll never forget his words. I was kind of just shell-shocked, not even sure how to react or process. I mean, I was practically a trauma victim. I just checked out. I nodded my head. He told me good. Told me to go home, wash up. I was done for the day. I went home, didn't tell any of my family. And when I returned the following couple days, we never spoke a word about this event again. But Glenn started hanging around with me every time I was at the barn. We never had any issues after that, at least on his property. It appears that this thing was all around that area too. Who knows where else it could have been. I don't know if this was the same creature we dealt with three times. But from my memory, each time, the creature looked somewhat identical. Although, the one that I saw when I was 16 with my girlfriend was, I think, mostly black, but the same face, the same insane human intelligence, the same evil, hateful demeanor. I've had a couple of more encounters since then, but nothing like these first three. These did more than enough damage to me, and were more than terrifying. I understand if my story sounds kind of fake and overdone, but I don't know how to write this down and be truthful about my experiences without sounding like a Hollywood horror movie. I did my best, and I'm no writer, so excuse if things are jumbled all over. I'm sure, and I hope, you'll be able to read this and make sense of things. If not, please ask me if you have any questions at all. I'd be happy to assist. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much for your time. Story 11 In the Road The events of this story have left me truly terrified. To be honest with you, I don't know how I've managed to process everything. It was dark out, one early spring evening, when I came home around a curb in the road. There it stood. I slammed on my brakes. It still managed to stand there, never turning. But then, it turned in response to my vehicle. It was maybe five to six feet tall. Not huge, but bulky. The biggest shock of my life came when I saw that it had the head of a wolf. The eyes were that of a dull yellow. The hair all over it was a mix of brown and gray, while the body had bits and pieces of black. It stared at me, and I at it. Then, it kind of just casually wandered off on the other side. I could only see it from the waist up, and it was running. I slammed the car in reverse, flooring it. I went right home, told my wife what I had seen. She asked me if I had been drinking, but I told her I wasn't. Name me one person ever who drank any amount of alcohol at all and seen anything like what I had witnessed this very night. I don't think it's possible. I just don't see it being a reality. How could something like this exist? And I hadn't even been drinking. It, the whole thing just freaked me out. I didn't even know what it was. I do know of something called Bigfoot, but I'm pretty sure that's not what I saw. At least, I'm sure it's not what I saw. Last I checked, Bigfoot don't look like wolves, do they? Story 12. The Backcountry I was out for a hike one day in the Idaho backcountry, and I seen this huge, upright walking canine tearing into an elk. I didn't realize what it was at the time, but 
after later on doing some needed research. I figured it might be a werewolf, or what I suspect to be something that looks akin to one. I'm not sure if that's what the creature was, but it was just some huge, upright walking canid. It was around 7pm, so evening time, and I was on a game trail. I had been out there for roughly three hours by now, and I was at the farthest point from my vehicle. I see this thing just to my left, tearing into this poor bull elk. It was huge, and so was the elk. But this thing had no problems not only catching up to the elk, but ultimately tearing into it. It was huge, and kind of walking upright, but it was hunched over, and once it killed this elk, it picked it up and was kind of dragging it, almost carrying it. I couldn't see its whole face, but part of it. It had all this wild matted hair all over, and had these crazy red eyes. I stood there for a long time, just watching this thing, pull back and carry this thing away. I was scared, so I turned around, and I fled. Once I got back to my car, I never went down that game trail again after that. You can't really tell from the story, but I was extremely terrified. I know, in story format, that can be really hard to convey. Just understand that it was a rough experience. Story 13 Down in a Ditch This was back in 1995, in the state of Minnesota. I'm a retired police officer, so believe me that I pay high attention to detail, unlike others. I've even been told that by friends and family, where I will pick up on stuff sooner than relatives will. But this was back before I joined the academy. One evening, I was driving from my girlfriend's house home late one night. I was about halfway home when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye in a ditch. I kind of slowed down and saw something tall and dark seemingly on all fours in the ditch on the side of the road. I wasn't sure what it was at first, but I could see it was very large. It appeared to have a huge head and a slender body. It kind of looked like a human on all fours, but it looked different. As it got closer, I assumed it was maybe a brown bear, maybe a black bear, but then I saw more of the details. It was too much like a human with hair all over it, which I thought was odd and those details usually don't mesh. Whatever it was, was kind of crawling around in the ditch. Then it popped its face up. It reminded me honestly of a mix of a fox, a human, and a wolf. If a man's head had sharp teeth and elongated nose and kind of fox-like eyes, that's what it made me think of. Or as silly as this sounds, a man-fox-wolf. Then, it stood up really fast. And for the first time, I saw just how big and tall this creature was. As it stood up, it turned around and fully faced me, with not just its face, but its entire body. And its eyes seemed to glow differently than they would with headlights illuminating them. Like a deer, but these were different. It was more. There was something about this animal that just seemed more wild than others. I was afraid to make any sudden movements. I had no idea what I was dealing with. This thing's behavior could be very unpredictable. I'm not sure what I would have done if this thing had tried to attack me or break through my car. It had stayed with me longer, just sitting there. It didn't do anything staying perfectly still itself. Then, it went back down to all fours and kind of scurried off, very strangely, into the nearest tree line. When I could finally move again, I drove as fast as I could, never taking that road again. I'm not sure what that was, but I never wanted to go back to that same spot. I spent time talking to my girlfriend about it. She was concerned and believed me, I mean, 
I was pretty scared about the whole thing. I even told some friends and relatives, and going by my acute attention to detail, they knew I had no reason to make anything up. I mean, why would they? And the older I've gotten, it's like the more I've had to realize that these things happen, these creatures are out there, and even more so, the older I get, I start to listen to these paranormal podcasts that are all over YouTube, and they talk about these strange dog cryptid creatures called dogmen. They're most certainly not werewolves. These are not men and women who shapeshift. These are something else. It didn't take long for me to mentally connect the dots. Story 14. The Grove Back in California in the 1980s, out in a grove, located out here in the hills, I saw a creature that looked something like out of a werewolf movie. Before, at the time, I didn't understand that these creatures were called dogmen. Anyway, here's my story. In the 1980s, there was a grove in the hills near the community where I grew up in Northern California. People would go there to take the view of the valley at the bottom of the hill. There was usually a lot of wildlife, mostly deer, some coyotes. I was on the side of the hill where there were some thick trees and saw something that did not fit. It was a brownish creature that appeared to have a really long snout and a long bushy tail. It was kind of dragging on the ground. I watched it for a while as it would stop and look at me, then would move on. Every few steps, it would stop, look back in my direction. I was about to walk down the hill to it, but it just walked away. It was walking on two legs and didn't look like a bear or a coyote. I started to hear a bunch of shotgun fire, and then the creature jumped up on a fallen tree running off, so I run back down to the community, tell my friends and a few adults what I saw, but they just laughed it off, said it was some sort of coyote. I would later find out this was a dogman, that it was some sort of natural nocturnal animal. Somehow this creature was normal to some of the people. I think the eyewitnesses saw a coyote that was standing, but I'm not sure. Some of them described it differently, while some describe the details more wolf-like. Others talk about it being a large upright coyote, or a big dog. I'm really not sure what to make of it, but it was very, very strange. More strange than scary, I should say. Story 15. The Michigan Experience I was spending the week with my mother and my new stepdad up here in northern Michigan. It was 2017 and I was halfway through high school. Classes were still in session, but on account of my mom's new marriage, my brother and I were allowed to spend some extra family time together outside of school. My mom seemed to feel a vacation would somehow bring all of us closer together. so. We rented a cabin. It was alright, I guess. A little quaint little place with a bit of a country feel. Not like the city where I was so accustomed to living. I thought my new stepdad was a little strange. He liked to tell stories about werewolves and dogmen. He believed the two were somehow related. In my opinion, the creatures were one and the same. But that was only based on what I'd heard not actual facts. My stepdad was convinced he'd actually seen one of the creatures when he was just a boy. I guess that's what started his whole infatuation with the idea. Personally, I have never been one to blindly believe anything anyone told me. I needed proof. The dogman was a highly unlikely being. A creature with a man's body and the head of a dog I had a strong interest in biology, but the whole thing just didn't add up to me, genetically. I had just entered the dining room when it happened. My brother 
was just about to take a bite out of his sandwich. He could see the look on me and my stepdad's faces, and his eyes shifted from our stepdad and then to me. We were both staring over my brother's shoulder and out the window behind him. My stepdad and I exchanged astonished glances. We just couldn't believe our eyes. There, in the backyard, was a man hunkered over with his head in our charcoal grill. It was odd behavior to say the least. My stepdad had made all of his steak and salad, but the surface of the grill had been cool to the touch for some time, so why would anybody want to sniff the bricks or coal was far beyond me. I think my brother thought we were staring at him. He lowered his sandwich down and began to silently sit there. My stepdad and I, of course, weren't judging him. We continued to watch in horror as what we thought was a man lifted his shaggy mane and began sniffing around. Then we realized this was no ordinary man. In fact, it wasn't a man at all. The shirtless human male torso appeared to be kind of a chestnut brown, yet the head was most captivating. Long strands of hair, wispy and thick, like that of a Pomeranian, painted on in thick coats of jet black, bits of coppery red, and a shock of white, stretched out on both sides of its face. The eyes were also what kept us mesmerized. They were this cold amber color. I had never seen anything so strange and beautiful and haunting all at once. The creature strained his stance. He knew he'd be seen and they were watching him. I tugged on my stepdad's shirt sleeve. We sprinted from the dining room to the kitchen toward the back door and towards the patio area. We both charged for the door. My stepdad beat me there. I wasn't upset. All I could think about was getting a better look at the creature outside. Once my stepdad and I stumbled our way out into the open, the impossibly tall like dogmen began to back up while staring at both of us. I reached out my hand, unsure if the creature would act like a dog or a man. To my utter amazement, the creature let out this howl. At least that's what I think. It sounded kind of like a human screaming. Its teeth were long and curved, like miniature spikes, but much thinner. They were still bigger in size and like a large breed's canine's teeth. None of them were jagged, at least like people describe in urban legends. I could feel my blood beginning to curdle, and I seriously began to wonder why we had come outside in the first place, both of my palms sweating and my heart racing like crazy. Fight or flight had kicked in, and I wished desperately it would all go away, but I couldn't. I had forgotten to move. My stepdad hadn't, though. He had slipped his cell phone deftly out of his pocket and was getting ready to record this thing. The creature, dogman, whatever it was, spun around quickly. Its lower torso appeared to be that of a canid, it was so strange to watch him run off on two feet, and I actually doubted that I was really seeing what I saw. In my opinion, I don't think canines were ever meant to run as bipeds. It gives them this strange kind of gait, or at least this one did. It almost bounced as it bobbed up and down in a blur of speed. I stared after it for a long time, eventually staring at the spot where it ran off down to the trees. My stepdad looked almost giddy with a huge grin on his face. I have never seen a smile so big in all the time I'd known him. I was hoping he had gotten some footage, but when I peeked, the image he had taken was distorted. Of course, my stepfather was disappointed. In some strange way, witnessing a dogman up close and personal had brought me and my stepdad a little closer than we once were. After heading back inside, the house, but not in defeat, but as a newly formed team in search of truth, I know it, he knows it, and now you know it. 
never stop believing in these creatures. I know I won't. Story 16 Wine and Dog Man I was out on a friend's ranch one evening, drinking wine together and enjoying the beautiful June sunshine here. Because we're kind of out in the country, it's very hot and dry, lots of flies, lots of sun. Not like the city, where it rains constantly, full of overcast and grossness. My friend and I thought wine would be the perfect way to unwind this evening together. We had been girlfriends since high school, so we always knew how to party. Although, two moms in their early 30s hardly partied. After a few glasses and talking crap about our husbands, we decided to head back to the house. We were walking along this small horse trail that led right through their patch of woods on the property, and it stopped at the top of this small hill and kind of had this beautiful lookout view where if you stand just right, you have a gorgeous view of the sunset. You know, I don't think I had ever really been in awe of the beauty before. At least, not as perfect as this was. The sun was setting just right, and I was so inspired by the light, the atmosphere, and the ambiance. As we're looking out, my friend kind of gasps and points down, and she says, Hey, what is that? I look, and even with the huge mountains in the distance, with lots of red rock, down at the base were these two large dogs, or so they looked like it, but they were crouched down kind of weird, and looking up in our direction. I told my friend, wine glass in hand, staring down at these things, I don't know, they look like two large dogs, what do you think they are? Are, do you have wild dogs around here? Are they wolves? We're both looking at these things strangely because they look so weird. Their portions were very different than that of a wild dog and they looked much bigger than a wolf. She just told me, I don't know. I mean, I know we have coyotes around here, but not those. And we're staring at these things. They keep looking back up at us like they see us too. Eventually, they both turn their heads towards the woods, and they both get up and kind of walk off. I can't tell if they were just lying down or what they were doing, but they both appear to be crouched down, the way a person would, and they had a very strange walk, like their back legs were much shorter than their front, and their front arms were very long. They looked very strange, and I've never seen an animal quite like that. At least, that would match a description fitting those. After they walked off and disappeared in the tree line, I kept nudging my friend and asking her, Are you sure those weren't coyotes? Are you sure you don't have wild dogs? Because I've never seen an animal like that in my life. She just kept telling me, No, I swear. I've never seen those before. I didn't even know they were around here. Maybe there's some new species of wolf. I don't know. And even from the distance we were at, you could tell these animals, whatever they were, were very, very large. If I had to say, it might be kind of overkill, but at least the size of a bear. Especially from the distance we were at, maybe a couple of hundred feet at most. You could very well see each other. I don't know. We talked about it for a couple of more minutes when my friend told me, maybe we should go back inside. I don't have the greatest feeling about all this. I figured the wine was just getting to her, so I said, all right, no worries, let's go. So we grabbed our glass, we both walked back down the trail, still talking about what it could have been. Then, out of nowhere, comes the craziest scream I've ever heard off in the valley, right where we saw those things. I wish I could duplicate it for you, because it sounded so inhuman, but at the same time, it sounded so much like a wild animal. It was almost like some sort of deep wild man screaming. Both my friend and I stopped, looked at each other, looked back. 
my friend dropped her wine glass. I slapped her on the shoulder. Oh, come on. Don't be so cliche. It wasn't that scary. But she was really wide-eyed and seemed panicked. No, I don't know what those are. I've never heard anything make that sound before. I just kind of rolled my eyes. Sure, what we heard was scary, but I felt like she was just overreacting. I just grabbed her. Clearly, the wine had been getting to you, and you're a little too unwinded. Let's go. As we got back to the house, she kind of stopped talking. I could tell she was kind of clammed up and seemed really unnerved by what we had heard and what we had seen. I mean, she wasn't wrong, but I'm sure the whole thing was nothing, right? Well, when we get back to the house, she gets a phone call from her husband, maybe 20 minutes later. He's going to be home pretty late. He had something to do with his friends or something. I think there was an emergency, and he was needed in order to help his friend move, or so I take it. So, it looked like it was going to be just us girls for the night. So I said, you know what? Let's go ahead, let's turn on a good movie on Netflix, and let's just lay down and crash. And that's what we did. It was about 8.30 at night now, and so we turned on some movie that I didn't know, I'd never seen before, and poured us both another glass. I was already getting pretty tired, so I couldn't imagine lasting much longer. Before 9 p.m., my eyes were shut, and I was snoring. The next thing I know, I'm being shaken violently. It's my friend. She was shaking me. Elaine, Elaine, get up. Get up now. There's something outside. And here I am in this half-sleep, half-wine daze. What are you talking about, Stephanie? There's nobody outside. She tells me, no, you don't understand. There's something really big outside the house. And it's making noises. I just looked at her strangely, thinking, girl, you've had way too much to drink. But I've known Stephanie since I was in high school. She's never like this. She was genuinely terrified. Something had this girl spooked. I mean, she'd lived out here for years. What could be out here that would scare her so bad? I relaxed and I said, it's probably just a bear. I mean, you do live out in the country. It's not like they aren't out here, after all. She shook her head violently. No, you don't understand. Something is outside my house. Wanting to humor her and not make her feel bad, I just told her, okay. I sat up and tried to wake myself up and see what I could do to help her. I went towards the back door, turned on the light. Nothing. So I turned and asked her, what are you hearing and where? She points towards the front. She said, I could hear something big moving around. I don't know what it is, and I'm too afraid to open the door. So I walked over there, turned on the front porch light, opened the door. I didn't see anything, even though the porch light only extends maybe 20 feet out, but nothing. The night seemed still. There were crickets. Hmm. I closed the door. I figured, well, sorry to say, but either you had a dream or whatever it is is now gone. As she was finishing her sentence, saying, yeah, but you don't understand, we hear this god-awful scream, the same one we heard earlier, maybe not even a hundred feet away from the house, on towards the side. We both looked at each other with the biggest eyes either of us had ever heard. I knew in that moment she wasn't wrong. She just looked at me, never broke her gaze. What do we do? We should call the police, I told her. But she retorted and said, They're not going to do anything. This is some wild animal. Really, what are they going to do? We're not under any physical threat. I demanded she turn on all the lights. We went and grabbed knives from the kitchen and stayed put, waiting for her husband to return home, since it was about to be early morning, and he should be getting back any time by now. I went and grabbed his knives, 
we both turned on every light in the house and sat put. We both had the biggest butcher knives she owned and were waiting and were waiting. She goes to the back door again, looks out, doesn't see anything, decides to open the sliding glass door. I tell her, Stephanie, don't. We don't know if that thing's still out there. She opens the door, knife in hand, and yells out, If you're out here, I have a knife, and I'll stab you if you get close to my house. One thing I immediately noticed as I walked up behind her, the sound of crickets was no longer there. It was eerily silent. The entire night almost now had this atmosphere to it, like it would consume you alive. I asked her, Do you hear that? She turned around to look at me. Hear what? There's no crickets anymore. Where'd the sound go? She slams the sliding glass door, locks it, closes the blinds. We just decided to sit there and wait. Maybe about 2.30 comes, and we hear her husband come pulling down the driveway. Oh, thank God. Maybe about a couple minutes later, her husband kind of just casually walks in the house, wondering why his wife and his wife's best friend are sitting on the couch, all the lights on. It's 2.30 in the morning. We're awake, and we have knives in our hand. He just says, uh, is there something I should know about? My friend runs over to him crying, saying, I'm so happy you're home. We had an incident and went to explain to him what happened. As he, she's telling him this, his eyes kind of widen. Then he kind of looks puzzled. When she finishes, he explains that as he was coming down the driveway, he saw something big, but just assumed it was a large black bear since he only caught a glimpse of it. But after hearing what she had to say, he was very calm, very collective. Went, pulled out his gun safe, or pulled out a rifle from the gun safe, I should say, and just said, I'll tell you what, you ladies go and get some sleep. I'll hang out right here. Right here on the steps. If this thing shows up, it ain't gonna live. But let's face it, me and my friend, there's no way we were going to catch an ounce of sleep. We were too wired, off fear and adrenaline. We weren't sure what to do. So we kind of just waited around and barely made it awake by about 6 a.m. It was light enough that we can go outside and see that there was nothing around. Whatever it had been was now gone, and had probably been gone for quite some time. The husband, who had fallen asleep on the stairwell, we woke him up. He explained to us that, see, it was probably just a bear. My friend made me stay an extra couple of nights just to keep her safe, as, you know, moral support. I did, and the next few nights were pretty uneventful. No sounds. Crickets were in full effect. Nothing. She has had absolutely zero issues since this has happened. She still lives there, and yes... I still go over there and drink wine from time to time. This was the only time ever we heard and saw anything. And part of me thinks it was maybe a fluke. And maybe we just imagined it all. I don't know. I can't say for sure. But what I can say is that I'm glad we have not had to deal with it since. And I'm glad my friend is safe. Story 17 The Mysterious Figure I remember the day well. It was December 2017 when this happened. I was driving home from work. I live in the southern half of the US, so there wasn't exactly a lot of snow. I think I'd seen actual snow only maybe once or twice in my whole entire life. That night, it was not snowing, but it was cool outside. There weren't any other cars or trucks on the business loop. It was just the time of day when traffic was slow, even near the holidays. The setting just seemed right for something unexplainable to happen. I had my music blasting in my car as I took the exit ramp off the business loop. I stopped at the stop sign, checked both ways for traffic, but nobody was coming. I turned right 
leaving the highway ramp. As soon as the passing gas station goes, I see a dark figure lying on the side of the road. Normally, I'm not really one to help strangers. It was a rule I followed to help keep myself safe. You just don't know anymore. Yet, I felt compelled to check this situation out, for obvious reasons. I pulled my car over and put it in park. I reached for my phone and wanted to make sure I was able to dial 911 or the police if need be. I slid it in my back pocket and climbed out of the car. There wasn't much light, but the moon was hiding behind a bunch of clouds with only a small silver lining shining down. The gas station was a ways behind me, just far enough that the light illuminating the pumps wasn't helping me see at all. I stumbled, almost fell into the brush as I made my way to a large, unresponsive human lying on the side of the road. As I reached out to shake the man's shoulder, he suddenly jerked awake. I watched in horror as he quickly spun around, pushed himself to his full height. I was tall for a girl, but my dad was tall. But this thing, he went almost like twice my size. And as the clouds moved from blocking the moon, I gasped as the full light poured over this being's body. I say being because this wasn't a human like I initially thought. I screamed, and I screamed. The figure that I thought was a defenseless man was instead some sort of hairy beast. He had the upper body of a man, but his skin was smooth, legs like a dog, and kind of a large torso with a dog for a head. In fact, it looked a lot like a wild animal with yellow eyes. Its ears perked up, sharp, like a Doberman's. When it opened its mouth, its teeth were longer than any dog breed I'd ever seen. The fur along with its face were kind of a dark burnt color. It was not natural. It seemed to be some sort of wolf creature. Its arms were incredibly large. It was real. This was not somebody in some costume on stilts. I could see the moisture on its nose. It glistened. The whole creature stole a step toward me. I was in like a trance state. I could feel my muscles tensing up. I was a little surprised to see this thing, wild animal, walking on two legs like a human would. But the hind legs were shaped like a dog's, with hawks and all. I didn't know what to do. I had completely forgotten how to speak or act. I wanted to back away, but it's like my body forgot how to move, how to react. My cell phone began to vibrate. The sound seemed to make the beast curious and kind of looked down at me, almost with a very inquisitive expression. Then the next thing I know, it bolts off and I lost total sight of him. Yet, I could still hear its noises not far away. It was extremely creepy, like hearing a man screaming, screaming like he was being tortured. Yet behind the scream was this visceral, animalistic sound. It was almost as if both were sounding at the same time, like split vocals. I'm not sure if there were more like him, but I was just glad to still be alive. I ran in my car as fast as my legs would carry me, tripping and falling like an idiot, breaking my fall with my palms, bits of earth and dry grass pressed firmly to my skin as I attempted to push myself back up onto my feet. I fumbled with my keys to press the unlock button, climbing to the back side inside my car, quietly locking it. Then I raced home. I told my boyfriend about what had happened. He was the one who tried to call me earlier, wondering where I was. And maybe he had unintentionally saved my life. Because I can't say, had my phone not gone off and vibrated, who knows what would have happened. But of course, he didn't believe my story. I mean, who would? It wasn't common for one to encounter some sort of 
half man, half dog, after all. I just hope that by sharing this encounter, you might think twice about stopping to help others on a dark, cloudy night. Besides, you never know who might be there waiting for you, deep in the shadows. I'm a local journalist, and my job is relentless. I had spent a lifetime chasing down truth from rumors and following news that would frequently take me out of my hometown of Troy, Michigan. In 2014, the editorial team asked me to follow a story from Detroit. Normally, I would jump on any opportunity to leave home, but at the time, I had a strange feeling holding me back. Part of it was due to my uneasiness driving after my shoulder surgery, and partly due to listening to my colleagues say that Route 75 is a paranormal magnet. I was pacing outside my boss's office, thinking of some sort of excuse to not go, and I noticed Frank packing up his desk. He was moving to another job outside of Troy, and that meant my chance for a promotion was maybe finally here. So, I decided to swallow my anxiousness and take on the story. I called my dad and asked if I can take his car, to which he replied, young journalists are not paid enough on their own yet. Detroit, well, I can come along, and I'll stop at your Uncle Sean's place, my dad had answered me. I cringed from the inside, but agreed. We don't have much in common. I'm a timid, antisocial. He is outspoken and loud. However, I really wanted the Detroit store to help me with the promotion, and the road trip would probably mean a lot to him too. Neither of us had any commitment after work, so we headed right out afterwards, straight down Route 75. He tried churning up some conversation, but I was tired and wanted to be fully awake the next morning. So... I started to nod off in the car. Detroit is not far from Troy, but every second felt like an hour. I do not remember when I actually fell asleep. Probably when Dad started telling strange stories of strange creatures that had been seen lurking near Troy at nighttime. Maybe I should have been paying attention to this part. Not soon into the trip, I heard a loud thud hitting my head on the car window as I was leaning towards. Hey, are you up? My dad said. I think I saw something. Probably it was nothing, he whispered. I shook my head, no, and just answered in murmurs. It was dark. We were no longer on Route 75. I remember making frustrated remarks, but his attention was completely elsewhere. His hands gripping the steering wheel. You were asleep. There was an accident on Route 75, and I knew a way to bypass it over here by the fairgrounds and the cemetery. I rolled my eyes as I reached in my pockets to open the map on my phone. I tried to unlock my phone, but realized it was completely dead. I was so fixated on reaching Detroit that it had slipped my mind to charge it before leaving. The car kept moving along, but then it seemed to slow down. I opened my eyes wider, turning towards my dad to see his eyes wide open and staring at the rearview mirror. I still remember the look of his face, his jaw hanging down. He kept driving ahead slowly, but his eyes were glued to the rearview mirror. Not knowing what was going on, I asked him to let me drive, while dad kept asking me strange questions not stopping. I asked him again to stop the car and switch seats with me. He was hesitant at first, but finally agreed. I got out of the car, and soon after getting out, a noise from off in the direction of the cemetery caught my attention. I was looking around to find the source. I scanned the horizon looking for whatever it was, and what I saw was nothing like I could have ever imagined. What I was seeing was a dark-haired, furry, wolf-looking creature, Huge in size, about as big as a fully grown horse. I squinted my eyes, thinking it was a play of the light. But the bright yellow eyes that were staring back into mine 
were definitely real. Even though the creature was at least a few hundred feet away from us, his incredible size was clearly noticeable. Its presence behind our stopped car, looking towards us, was just something I could feel, even that far away. I'll never forget the feeling I had when I first looked at it. It was majestic. It had a sense of undeniable power. I felt it could make anybody feel shivers down their spine and make their hands quiver, just like how I felt in that very moment. However, I'm a journalist, so I decide I can capture this beast with my camera, show people what I saw. I very slowly moved my hand, reaching for the door handle, while also reaching for my camera. In my hand, I was moving slowly enough that I would not be noticed by the creature, who was still a distance away. Unlucky for me, I was wrong. The beast howled a cry at the most unbelievable spectrum and rose up back on its two back feet. Its muscled body was now easily nine feet tall, and its dark fur made it seem even more ominous and horrifying. However, the strangest part of this vision was the creature's human-like build. It was striking. The only typical wolf features were the tail, the sharp set of paws at the end of each limb, and the snarling wolf head. By this point, my dad jumped inside the car to the passenger seat, and I had moved across the driver's side. He quickly helped me open the seat door and yanked me inside, yelling me to hit the accelerator. At first, I was in shock, but as he pushed my knee and slapped me to my senses, I shut the half-open door, pressing the pedal to its limit, without ever looking back in the rearview mirror. My hands were gripping the steering wheel, white-knuckled. I was still shaking as I drove away and tried to process what had just happened these past one to two longest minutes of my life. My father saw it too, and he knew what he saw, but cannot verbally acknowledge it. As far as I'm concerned, I hope it's the first and the last time I catch a glimpse of the notorious Dogman of Michigan. I've had a lot of unusual things happen to me in my life, but nothing so peculiar as that May 19th, 2017, when my husband and I visited the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast here in Massachusetts. What was supposed to be a spooky fun trip turned out to be the most frightening night of all our lives, and it wasn't the house that left a lasting memory, but what happened afterwards that really stuck with us. I was always fascinated with the supernatural. My husband was more of a skeptical type. I convinced him to come with me to one of America's most haunted sites to prove to him the existence of ghosts. We made a little bet. If he saw something he logically could not explain, well, I could go buy some new clothes and he'd have to accompany me on some other historically haunted places. If nothing ever happened, well, he appeared to be staged and I would never bother him with my paranormal fascination ever again. I knew I'd win. I could feel it in my blood. So, we started on a long drive down the highway to Fall River, Massachusetts. When we got to the bed and breakfast, we traveled with a small group and a very knowledgeable tour guide. We were able to see every room in the old Victorian home. Supposedly, the site was famous for a double murder from 1892. The daughter of Andrew Borden, Lizzie Borden, was suspected by many to have been the culprit of her father and stepmother's murder. But the court let her go, assuming she was innocent. After her court victory, she immediately sold the house. It was later turned into a bed and breakfast, but visitors were so often spooked. We stayed in the John V. Morse room where Abby Borden was actually found murdered. We left the door shut, but during the night, it mysteriously popped open on us. I could feel the negativity in the air increasing. The temperature in the room had dropped considerably. I knew we were definitely not alone. 
My husband just groggily said the door had clearly not been shut tightly, and the airflow in the room was to blame for the door opening, not ghosts. He did complain, though, of the room being cold. As we sat up in bed, debating who was right, a shadow traveled across the hallway with no body accompanying it. We both clearly saw it, and I could tell from the look on his face that he was now a believer. We looked at each other, rushing for the exit. We only briefly stopped to pay for our stay before heading into the early morning darkness. We fumbled with our keys as we hurried toward the vehicle. That's when we saw it. It was a good way to describe this being. Half man, half dog, with the head of a canine. The creature was literally lurking around the barn that had been reconstructed into a gift shop. I couldn't speak. I was too stunned. Instead, I tugged on my husband's sleeve, and he was super focused on getting our stuff back into the trunk. He did not even notice that thing was standing upright on two legs. I took a step back. I didn't even mean to do it. It was sort of instinctual. I wasn't sure if what I was seeing at first was new, or maybe that something science had been experimenting on, and, or perhaps something mythical that man had not yet known about. I whispered to my husband as this canine-like creature plopped down on all fours and stared at us hesitantly. My husband, who was still traumatized by the sight of the ghost in the bed and breakfast, wasn't even noticing the creature approach us with a sort of wild curiosity. I bravely stepped past my husband and could now see the creature's vibrant, aggressive, intelligent eyes. Its head looked kind of like that of an Australian shepherd, and it was amazing, but frightening all at the same time. It kind of had like a mane, if that makes sense, and its arms and body was so muscular and wide, I couldn't imagine much standing in his way. This thing was utterly terrifying, but it had spotted patches of black all around the back, and its gaze had me rooted in place. I kind of wanted to lean forward to get a better look, but just then, my husband slammed the trunk, and the creature jumped off and ran to the back. I was kind of annoyed, and I turned and flashed my clueless spouse a look, asked what he did if he saw that thing. He only shrugged, having clearly missed the whole thing. So, we both climbed into the vehicle and began our long drive home. I can never get the encounter out of my mind and even went with my best friend on vacation back to the same bed and breakfast, just hoping to see the creature that had been lurking outside this barn just outside the view of others. We both saw some strange things we could not explain, not to mention all the paranormal activity surrounding the property. But sadly, like I just said, the dogman wasn't the only thing, though I never did see this creature again. This was also near a wooded area, and it was one of the strangest experiences I've ever had, and definitely one I will never forget as long as I live. It was late October 2017 close to Halloween, and I was living in New Hampshire at the time. Some friends and I decided to go to one of those big city Halloween parties, except we later figured out it was for teens. I thought it was going to be lame like all the other parties I'd been to in the past. Man, I could not have been more wrong if I tried. That Halloween night will stay with me for the rest of my life. My costume was pretty lame, but... My mom had made it for me, and I did not want to hurt her feelings, so I wore it regardless. My friends were all dressed in way better costumes, but oh well. We were all ready to kick back and have some fun for the rest of the evening. There was just one catch. We had to cut through a notoriously creepy cemetery to get to this party. It had seemed to stretch on for miles. To me, it looked like a sea of endless tombstones. I really appreciated the eerie atmosphere, though. It was perfect for something strange to happen. My friends and I were all striking poses in some creepy old granite mausoleum with a bunch of columns in front of it. 
The place looked really old. They all waved to me to join them in their photo shoot, but my eyes were fixed on something different entirely. And that's when things got really weird. As I got closer, peering out from beyond the shadows of the mausoleum was a pair of bright yellow eyes. It was as if they were silently beckoning me, curiously and almost in a trance from their glow. I stared past my friends and continued to close the gap between myself and whatever it is. As I got closer, I can make out a snout and dark gray fur. A low, guttural growl escaped its smoky gray muzzle. It didn't sound like a growl of malice. It was more like some kind of restless discontentment, its head slowly peeking out of the shadows. Under the bright moonlight, I could see it much more defined, its body covered in fur and a head to its collarbone. But the upper torso was completely human, yet almost triangular in build, with its massive muscle arms that all seemed to thin out right down to the waist. From there, the body became canine again, its long and fluffy tail stood erect behind it as it decided whether or not I was friend or foe. I held out my hand like I would any new dog I was meeting for the first time. I took a few hesitant steps towards me and then stopped just as quickly. Under better lighting, I could see the bits of medium brown fur hidden with the gray-black strands. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I mean, Part of me wanted to touch the fur on its head, and the yellow eyes were horrifyingly captivating. They were wild and kind of evil, actually. It was strange. So, I kind of seemed locked in this trance, like it was capturing its prey, and I felt nothing except going towards it more and more slowly. This thing came towards me. I could see the reflection of the moisture on its black nose. I knew this was much more than a person in a costume. But even though it was vicious, it had not yet attacked me. It was more intelligent than that, like it was planning on something. Suddenly, my boyfriend motioned to me with his arm, as he called over to me to rejoin the group. I gasped with the sound of his voice. It must have startled the creature, for it froze in place and analyzed where the sound had come from. Very intelligently looking, mind you. Its ears kind of twitched and it rushed back into the shadows. It was terrifying. This thing did not belong in this realm. People might turn into some sort of strange experiment or something. I don't know. I was relieved. Who knows what it would have done to me had I actually made my way to it. It's almost like it mind-controlled me. I almost wonder if there's more of them. I mean... There had to have been more than one for it to physically exist. I thought about it the rest of the night, but never told them what exactly I saw. I mean, something like that on a Halloween night? How many people get to say they experienced that? I just remember how incredibly bright it was that night. That's the only reason I saw as many details as I did. I thought I saw that same familiar gray-black-brown of its body slipping into the nearby trees, but after squinting, I couldn't exactly see, not without the proper lighting. That was the last time I ever saw a strange creature, at least like that. Later on, though, I would eventually tell my friends about what I'd witnessed. My boyfriend just thought I was imagining things, and just saying, yeah, the darkness played tricks in your eyes, you're being too dramatic and maybe my friends thought I was trying to set the mood for spooky fun. But one thing's for sure, I'll never forget that harrowing account. Never. I used to be a canvasser for a consumer protection organization. For those who don't know what that means, a canvasser is somebody who walks around town, going door to door, knocking on strangers' doors, with a clipboard to ask for donations or spread awareness for a specific cause. The cause we were all working on was pipelines, and the governor's lack of commitment to limit pipelines and new oil and gas infrastructure in the state. As you might imagine, it's a tough job, both physically, because we each walked about 10 miles a day 
at work and emotionally because the most common response to our knock was a shut in the face. Also, I've been threatened with a gun. I've been hit on by a clearly naked person. And I've had the cops call on me more than my fair share. But honestly, I kind of get it. We're interrupting these people at home without their permission. And yes, as late as 8.30 at night. We're strangers, and I specifically am a rather large bearded man. I wouldn't harm a fly, and I consider myself a rather jovial, carefree person. But random people don't know that when they see me walking up to their house. So again, I get some more of their extreme reactions to a certain extent. One night though, I'll never forget this. I got the crap scared out of me. I knocked on a door and nobody answered. Next house. I knocked on the door, chatted with the nice guy for a few moments, and although this did not result in any donations or anyone signing up to become a member of my organization, I always appreciated nice small talk chats to break up the monetary perpetual rejection. Finally, I came up to one of the last houses on my route. It looked like it used to be some sort of old Gatsby-esque house, but it had fallen into disrepair. I knocked on the door, and in an instant, it swung open. This woman with large glassy black eyes and a face full of wrinkles, wearing a white nightgown with messy white hair, was staring at me. She stared at me so intensely, it felt like her eyes could cut right through me leaving a hole in the sidewalk behind me. Her eyes were lifeless. I gulped audibly. I didn't even know until that moment that was the real thing people do when they're scared. I managed to open my mouth but just barely squeak out a hi ma'am when the door swung shut in front of me. So hard, I thought it might break. While this might sound like a normal encounter on paper, there was something so intense, so unnerving, about that woman's empty stare that it sent me on edge for the rest of the night. Honestly, I would never tell my boss this. I just filled out the rest of my sheet saying everybody else was not home so that I would not have to keep working. I took out my phone to watch YouTube or maybe text my friends. Anything to take my mind off that woman. But I had no signal so I decided to just walk around a bit. As I walk along the empty streets, I realize there's something creepy about the suburbs when you're the only one on the street and all the house lights are off. When it's quiet and still like that, you realize you were just exposed. Every horror movie you've ever seen comes back to you, and you imagine that Freddy Krueger is right behind you, posed to attack. I kept walking down these empty streets looking for any sign of life so that I'd feel better. I knew my boss was not backing me up. And I'll tell you what, that scared me. It was the longest 20 minutes of my life. I turned a corner and saw some houses with their lights on and decided to head that way. Like I said, I was done working for the night. That lady definitely shook me up too much to have any real motivation. But just knowing there were other people awake calmed my nerves. It's not real protection, but... It's psychological ease of mind. I was walking towards the houses and already beginning to feel a little bit better. That's when I heard a ruffling in the trees alongside me. My heart dropped. I decided to pick up the pace, and to my horror, the ruffling followed me and picked up its pace too. I considered running, but the rational side of my brain took over, and I realized that whatever this was was probably just an animal and that if it was an animal, it could easily outrun me. So, my best bet was to make myself big and make loud noises to scare it off. I have no idea if this works for every predator, but that's what I went with. I got up as big as I could with my clipboard in my hand and yelled, Ugh! towards the trees. To my shock and absolute terror, the creature in the woods raised itself up too and made itself bigger. And in that moment of horror, that's when I got my first real look at it. The first thing I noticed was its paws, how huge they were. And my first thought was, 
that I royally messed up with this bear. Then I saw the fur. It was kind of dark and not really like a bear's. So I started to calm down, thinking maybe this was just some sort of big dog. But then it raised its head above the small brush. That's when I realized this thing was a wolf. Well, not a wolf. It had a wolf's head. But it also had that unmistakably man's body. At first, maybe this was some sicko wearing an advanced wolf mask, like in the movie Saw or something, but it opened its mouth, and I clearly saw saliva dripping out of its mouth, and the deep shine in its eyes. I realized in that moment, this was no mask. This was somehow a creature with the body of a human, and the features of a wolf. I was too scared to move. The wolfman creature took one step towards me, and my first instinct was to hurl my clipboard at it. I will never, to the day I die, stop being grateful that my clipboard made contact and promptly distracted this creature for a couple of seconds. It seemed distracted and kind of grumbled, and you bet that I took that time to run as fast as I could. You know what? At that point, screw my job. I don't even care. So... I ran down the street, got a good signal, called my boss, and told him, you need to pick me up now. I don't care. This is urgent. Come here now. Well, thankfully he listened. There was more than enough urgency in my voice for him to accept what I was telling him. But, you know, even when we got in the car, I never told my boss what I saw, and he never asked me. But he knew something was up. My body language and the look on my face told me everything. I quit my job a week later. When I was a kid, I went on a class field trip to celebrate the 100th day of school. It was a tradition in our high school that every year we'd all vote on a list of places to go. Whichever place got the most votes, in my year, we chose Glacier National Park. I remember literally running home the school the day they gave us the permission slips for my parents to sign. They signed, of course, and I couldn't even sleep that night. I was so excited. I had to start mentally preparing. All I could think about was hiking and being out in the trees and mountains and all the amazing wildlife. Of course, I was just a teenager, so the idea of bears was appealing to me rather than scary. But I really wanted to see elk and moose and wolves. All the fun stuff that I did not have a chance to see growing up in the relatively populated Columbia Falls. In case you couldn't tell already how bored I was by everyday life, after handing in my slip, I spent days pursuing online retailers, looking at hiking gear and everything, watching documentaries and countless YouTube videos. What turned my interest from a spark to a full-on explosion was the announcement that our school was going to hold a big sale to raise money for us to stay there overnight. I was ecstatic. Little did I know that I would see something on that trip that would not only ruin my love for the outdoors for a while, but also sent me to therapy for years following. After months of anxiously waiting, or maybe weeks, but certainly felt like months, the day arrived, obviously, and I could not sleep the night before. I just had to keep double-checking, triple-checking, making sure everything was packed. I made sure to bring extra film, got my sunscreen, my bug spray, and kept thinking about all the wonderful adventures we'd go on to as a class. And as you can imagine, the trip was kind of a letdown. Of course, the park is gorgeous and eating lunch amidst the mountains was insanely cool. I'll never forget that. But the trip was mostly educational. We learned about all the different stuff, the difference between deciduous and coniferous trees. We learned about the mountains and the different layers of rock and soil that likely went into their composition. As an adult looking back on this trip, this actually does sound kind of interesting, and I have gone back and looked up some of this information again, but as a 14-year-old, every science fact spouted by our teacher just robbed me of little hope. More hope that I'd end the day by riding a bear 
or making friends with a group of elk. As the day wound down, light turned into night, and we all had some free time to goof off. Play our Game Boys, whatever. I didn't have many friends in class yet since this was my first year, and I was coming from a middle school a few towns away, and my family had just moved. Anyway, eventually, dinner was ready. So, I sat down next to this kid, Brian. We kept chatting, and he introduced me to his friends, Margaret and Pete. I recognized the girl from around school, but I had no idea who Pete was. Turns out, he sat behind me, and Brian and I just never noticed him. We ate dinner, and as soon as the plates were cleared and everybody was back in by free time, we ducked out and made our escape. Margaret stuck out first, and she was almost caught. Next was Brian and then Pete. Finally me. My heart was racing as I evaded the menacing teachers. I had never done anything this daring before, which is why I was so excited to even just step foot in a national park. We were grouped just a few yards away from all the other kids. In retrospect, we were definitely still within eyesight, but we felt like four little Indiana Joneses, trekking our way through the wilderness to any kids listening to this right now, I cannot stress enough. This was a stupid idea. And we could have all been seriously injured and no adults would have known where we were to help. But we were young and dumb. Once we're sufficiently far from everyone else and giddy, we turn on our flashlights. Sure enough, we were kind of lost. We were exhilarated, but as kids do, completely failed to make a plan. That's when we realized something was wrong. We turned a corner and we saw something that scared the crap out of all of us. Nobody would believe us, but what we all saw was real. We saw a creature with the head of a wolf and the body of a man. At first, I thought it was somebody wearing a mask, but it let out this deep growl that sent my heart racing and my brain into panic mode immediately. That's when Brian shrieked, and luckily, that was enough for this thing to turn around and sprint off into the woods. Except it didn't run away. It was following us, coming after us as we ran, hiding in the woods for cover, but still staying right with us. We could hear it sprinting and its heavy thuds as it galloped alongside of us, probably waiting for the right opportunity to reach out and grab one of us and cover that's when I saw brief flashes of its hind legs, and where I expected to see its paw come out and grab one of us, I saw some kind of misshapen foot-paw hybrid. We all kept running and eventually made it back to camp without anybody being grabbed or snatched or eaten. Nobody had even realized we had left. I know my encounter short, but to this day, whenever we talk, which is rare, we will still talk about that night. What we saw and our shared struggle that nobody will believe us. This happened just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I have never considered myself to be superstitious. In fact, I have taken to building a career on the breaking down of this world's superstitious elements, having studied and worked in the fields of anthropology. Yet, despite this, one particular encounter that I had as a child stands out in my memory, never fading. One that by all accounts borders on the supernatural, and in the least, will go without explanation for a long time to come. I was a young girl when it happened, just 10 years old, and it was a Saturday, November 20th. I was with my best friend at the time, a young girl named Cindy, and we decided to spend our entire weekend at Penn Museum to research a school project. Cindy's father was a curator at the museum, and he gave tours on ancient civilizations, which granted us behind the scenes to the ancient Egyptian artifacts. We were also happy to be with a treasure trove of knowledge. Although we were young children whose passions lied elsewhere at the time, all the artifacts and knowledge that they had on display were truly awe-inspiring, and it could very well have been prompted by my interest in science. As Cindy and I decided to make full use of our time in the museum, 
by exploring as much of all the exhibits as we could. It was already dark outside when we finally settled down in the ancient Egyptian exhibit and began to work on our projects. Actually, the museum was already closed to visitors, and Cindy's father urged us to hurry it up so we can make it home in time for dinner. I was staying near the museum in a small apartment with my mom who would work in the city. My school was also nearby too, so it was convenient. Cindy's father asked whether anybody was coming to pick me up, and I told him that my mother would come to pick me up. He seemed reluctant at first, but eventually agreed to let me leave the museum. I gave our project to Cindy for safekeeping and headed out of the museum, ready to go home. And although it might seem dangerous for a young 10-year-old girl to be walking around the streets of Philadelphia alone at night, it was something I had done before this incident. So I figured this time it wouldn't be any different. There was a rather big stretch of forest that I would have to cross in order to get home, which did worry me a bit. This was dark after all. But it was private land and it was near the university, which meant there's a lot of patrolling security in the area. I mean, I figured if something happens or somebody tries to mug me or hurt me, I figured I could flag down somebody. So I almost immediately picked up on a very strange smell. One that reminded me of a wild animal. It kind of smelled like wild dog or something. I don't know. Like wet dog and stink. Anyway, I couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from, but since the patch of urban forest was near Penn Park, I figured it could have been an elk or deer. Maybe the owner of the land was trying his hand at farming. But as I progressed further, the smell became much more pronounced. As I went so deep into the property... That for a second, I forgot I was in the city, and as I made it halfway through the property, the smell now soon turned into an actual sound I could hear. It started with twigs breaking underfoot, and some crunching. I could tell whatever it was was making the sound was rather large. I paused for a second, and whatever was making the sound seemed to pause in sync with me. I looked around in hopes of seeing what was making the noise and giving off this awful feral scent. I caught a large silhouette in the corner of my eye. I focused my head toward it and almost fell flat on my back when I saw it. A couple of feet in front of me, a seven foot tall, monstrously built creature, covered from head to toe in fur. Its head was that of a wolf or a canine, with the rest of its body like that of a well-built man. It almost resembled that of a silverback gorilla, in body of course, with the head of a wolf. I literally couldn't figure out what I was seeing. The whole time I was watching it, it stood totally upright, like a man would. And as I picked myself up off the ground, this thing proceeds towards me, which in turn prompted me to bolt towards the nearest point of exit. I had far too much adrenaline going through me. As I came hurtling towards the nearest street, a car pulled up alongside me, and it was none other than Cindy and her father, who said he had followed me in his car when he saw me walking alone, but that I entered the property with the trees before he could offer me a ride. I told him what I'd seen, and although I could see he didn't exactly believe me on what I had seen, we did call the police to investigate. In turn, they tracked down and contacted the owner to confirm that there were signs of some sort of large unknown canine on the property, although nobody could say for sure. Perhaps one day with the tools I've acquired in training, in practice, in archaeology, that mystery is something I could finally answer. 